The speed at which aviation technology progressed during World War II was blistering. Spurred on by the need to win the war in the air, both sides pushed the envelope of what was possible, hoping to give them that war-winning weapon that would tip the scales firmly in their favor. Germany, in particular, is well known for its many outlandish designs that Hitler hoped would give the Luftwaffe a qualitative edge sufficient to match the quantitative edge the Allies possessed. But it shouldn't be forgotten that the Allies were just as creative in their approach to developing new aircraft. In today's episode, we are going to examine a handful of peculiar Allied prototype planes that bucked the trend of warplane design in the early 1940s. And while we may not remember them in the same breath as the Spitfire, Mustang, or Hurricane, they have nonetheless carved themselves a niche in the annals of military aviation history. Welcome to Wars of the World. Upon the outbreak of World War II, the Vickers Wellington was arguably the RAF's most capable bomber until the introduction of the new four-engined types like the Handley Page Halifax and the legendary Avro Lancaster. Incorporating famed engineer Sir Barnes Wallace's geodetic airframe design that works by creating a space frame formed from a spirally crossing basket weave of load-bearing members, the Wellington was a remarkably tough aircraft and one that was adaptable to a number of roles. To this end, in 1939, as the risk from advanced German fighters like the Messerschmitt Bf 109 became apparent, the British Air Ministry began exploring the possibility of developing a very high altitude version of the Wellington that could fly above German fighters and defensive anti-aircraft guns. Dubbed Operational Requirement OR-94, the Air Ministry specified an aircraft that could cruise at 35,000 feet, about 2,200 feet above the surface ceiling of the Dora model of the BF-109 that was the principal German fighter of the day. It was also to have a range of 2,200 miles and feature a pressurized cabin for the safety and comfort of the crew operating at these incredible altitudes. To meet these requirements, the team at Vickers produced the Wellington Mark V which featured a 12-foot wingspan and was powered by two 14-cylinder, 1,400-horsepower Bristol Hercules III radial aero engines. But the most obvious design change centered on the nose. In order to accommodate the pressurized cabin, the nose gun was deleted and the whole forward section redesigned into an almost whale-like shape. The aircraft was crewed by four, with the pilot now peering out from the transport dome on the top of the fuselage, while the navigator sat in the bullet-shaped forward nose section with small portholes from which to peer out. The rest of the crew was made up of a wireless operator and a gunner who would control the rear turret by remote from the pressurized cockpit using a periscope for sighting. First flying in late 1940, the Hercules radial engines soon proved to be unsuited for operating at such high altitudes, and only three aircraft were built. Vickers therefore decided to adopt the 1600 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin 60 engine, which was slated to power the new Avro Lancaster bomber and Supermarine Spitfire Mark IX. This was a much more satisfactory engine, and Vickers expected to undertake an initial production order of the Mark VI in late 1941. But by then, the Air Ministry were having doubts about the project. High altitude bombing was proving an extremely inaccurate method of attacking a target from the air, as even conventional bombers flying at half the altitude of the Wellington Mark VI had trouble hitting what they were aiming for. Also, high altitude flight produced a plethora of problems regarding the many fluids used to make the Merlins work, which often threatened to stall the engines. Vickers would ultimately build 63 Merlin-powered Mark VI's, but they would never see combat. Plans were pitched to use them in reconnaissance and Pathfinder roles, but the introduction of the high-performance Mosquito saw these plans shelved. The aircraft would have a short testing run, and even functioned as trainers for the advanced G radio bombing equipment before they were all scrapped in 1943.
In the 1930s, bombers were getting faster, better armed, and much tougher to knock down, with advances like better armor and self-sealing fuel tanks allowing them to absorb a lot of punishment. Consequently, air forces around the world began demanding faster and harder-hitting fighters, and this led to one of the more unique operational fighters of the Second World War, the Bell P-39 Aero Cobra. At first glance, the P-39 looks like many other fighters of the day, but on closer examination, you come to realize one key difference, and that is the positioning of the engine. Instead of being in the nose, the P-39's engine is mounted in the fuselage behind the pilot, a decision taken by the P-39's chief engineer, H.M. Poyer, to free up space in the nose for a powerful 37mm T9 cannon. An additional advantage to this configuration was that it allowed for a much more aerodynamically clean design, with a narrower nose section reducing drag. Another unique feature of the P-39 was its tricycle undercarriage, which would eventually become the norm during the age of jets. Despite its promise, the P-39 had a rather underwhelming career within the United States Army Air Force. While across the pond, the British Royal Air Force loathed it and were glad to replace them with Hawker Hurricanes and Supermarine Spitfires. The problem was that while it had good performance at low to medium levels, its Allison V-12 engine simply ran out of steam at the higher altitude combat over Western Europe. However, on the Eastern Front, this wasn't as much of an issue as a lot of the fighting took place at lower altitudes due to the Soviet Union's prolific use of tactical bombers supporting the army. In this arena, the P-39 was adored by Soviet pilots for its ruggedness and its firepower, and was such a complement of the Soviet Air Force that it was essentially adopted as a Soviet plane despite its American heritage. Soviet pilots liked them so much that many refused to give them up, and they were still being flown as late as 1949. The Soviet Union also adopted an improved version, dubbed the P-63 King Cobra, which built on the performance of the P-39 in almost every way. However, the P-39 was by no means the only mid-engine fighter of the period, although it was certainly the most successful. An effort to produce a carrier-capable variant for the US Navy resulted in the one-off Bell XFL Air Bonita, which differed from its land-based forebear predominantly in that it dispensed with the tricycle undercarriage, instead adopting a more conventional tail wheel and a tail hook for catching arrestor wires during landing on deck. Other requirements demanded by the Navy included larger wings to reduce landing speed aboard a carrier, and wings that featured flotation devices and 10 small bays to carry bombs that were intended to be dropped over large formations of enemy bombers. In the end, the Air Bonita lost out to the more conventional Grumman F-4F Wildcats, which went on to give a sterling service in the early years of World War II. Bell also worked on a new variant of the P-39, dubbed the P-76, which was intended to finally alleviate the engine's poor high-altitude performance, but despite showing great promise, wartime requirements saw a plan for 3,000 shelved, so Bell could build B-29 Super Fortresses under license from Boeing, these being seen as having a much higher priority for the war effort. But Bell was not the only American company working on a mid-engine fighter design. In 1942, the Fisher Body Division of General Motors Car Company put together a proposal for an aircraft that would possess a very high rate of climb to meet the needs of the US Army Air Force, who wanted a fighter that could get to its combat altitude quickly to intercept enemy bombers with minimal warning. Furthermore, Fisher wanted to use as much of the tooling already available within the US aviation industry as possible to speed up construction and maintenance. Their resulting aircraft, designated the P-75 and named Eagle, was something of a Frankenstein fighter, using the outer wing panels from the North American P-51 Mustang, the tail assembly from the Douglas SBD dive bomber, and the undercarriage from the Navy's Vought F-4U Corsair. As work on the initial prototypes proceeded through early 1943, the need for the aircraft's intended role diminished as the Allies began more offensive operations. However, this required long-range fighter escorts for bombers attacking Axis targets in Europe and the Pacific. Consequently, the P-75 was reworked as a long-range escort fighter, and providing that it met the requirements of the USAAF, Fisher were promised an order of 2,500 P-75As. First flying on November 17, 1943, the P-75 test program was wrought with problems, mostly centered around the aircraft's powerful engine requiring redesigns that took time to complete. 
With performance no better, or in some cases worse, than the proven Mustangs, it was decided to terminate the order before acceptance trials could be completed. And the aircraft spent their last days conducting test work for improving their Allison engines for use in other aircraft. An honorary mention in this category, since Italy did come over to the Allied side in 1943, was the Piaggio P119, developed using both Italian and German components. Compared to the P39, the P119 was faster, topping out at 400 miles per hour, while armament was expected to include a single 20mm cannon and four 12.7mm machine guns. The project was at an advanced stage when Italy signed an armistice with the Allies and the project was cancelled. Looking more like something you'd expect to find within the realm of a Flash Gordon or Dan Dare, the Manx originated from research conducted within the British Handley Page Company into a tailless bomber defender, essentially a long-range escort fighter. In order to prove the British Air Ministry the soundness of the concept, Handley Page committed to building a subscale development aircraft for testing and demonstration purposes, and this led to the Manx, a name derived from a type of cat found on the Isle of Man that has little or no tail. Like said feline, the Manx lacked a traditional tail unit save for a centralized, small area vertical tail fin. The wing main planes were constructed in two primary sections, with the thicker inboard section being used to mount two de Halavand Gypsy Major II engines, turning two bladed propellers arranged in a pusher configuration, another unique design choice for fighters of the day. The inboard section was given straight leading and trailing edge lines, while the outboard section lines were swept back to improve higher speed performance, and each featured a vertical stabilizer and rudder affixed to their tips. The pilot and observer were seated in tandem in a teardrop-shaped fuselage and were afforded an excellent view thanks to the heavy glazing around them. This allowed them to visually monitor as much of their unique aircraft as possible while in flight. Because of the perceived difficulties in exiting the aircraft in an emergency, the cone-shaped rear of the fuselage could be jettisoned, allowing the observer to escape quickly should the need ever arise. Another unusual feature of the Manx was that while the main undercarriage retracted, the nose wheel remained fixed in place during the flight. Constructed mostly out of wood, the one and only prototype was completed in 1940 and began taxi trials, but very quickly it was found that the wings were suffering from deterioration, requiring additional strengthening before a test flight could be conducted. Consequently, and with the pressures of war on Handley Page disrupting the program, Work would prove slow on the Manx, with further redesign work being necessitated to help alleviate many of the problems that were appearing mostly concerning the weight of the aircraft. On September 12, 1942, the aircraft was conducting another taxi trial when it briefly got airborne, reaching a height of 12 feet before returning to Earth. But even this short, unofficial first flight resulted in damage to the nose wheel. It would not be until June 11th, 1943, that the aircraft would finally take to the skies for the first time, with Handley Page's chief test pilot, James Richard Talbot, at the controls. Unfortunately, the planned test flight was cut short when the canopy detached, forcing Talbot to return to the airfield. Over the coming months, the Manx would conduct 30 relatively short test flights, logging up 17 hours by December 3rd, 1945, when Talbot and another test pilot involved in the program, Edgar Wright, were both killed test flying a Handley Page Hermes airliner. This had a detrimental effect on the Manx project, and only one more flight was undertaken in April of 1946 before it was placed into storage. Handley Page continued to try to find some fruit from the project, proposing tailless jet fighters, bombers, and transports, but ultimately they came to nothing, and sadly the one prototype was scrapped in 1952. After a decade of relative stagnation, when military aircraft were only marginally improved over their First World War predecessors, the late 1930s saw a revolution in design, spurred on by the need to rearm with aircraft better than potential adversaries. It was with this in mind that on November 27, 1939, the United States Army Air Corps issued Proposal R-40C, 
to America's plethora of aircraft manufacturers. The proposal outlined a requirement for a new advanced fighter aircraft that as well as having high performance and heavy firepower would also offer unparalleled visibility compared to contemporary fighter designs, something that was extremely valuable in a dogfight. Dubbed Proposal R-40C, the USAAC, which would be rebranded as the United States Army Air Force on June 20th, 1941, specified that it was willing to accept unorthodox designs to achieve these goals. Of the companies that entered, three would have their designs reach the prototype stage, and all of them employed a pusher configuration, that is, placing the propeller at the rear of the aircraft in order to give the pilots the best possible forward field of vision. First to fly was the Volte Company's XP-54, known as the Swoos Goose, which first took to the air on January 15th, 1943. Incorporating a twin-boom configuration in much the same way as the famed Lockheed P-38 Lightning, the aircraft was slated to be powered by the advanced Pratt & Whitney X-1800 engine. But after its development was cancelled, a Lycoming XH-2470 was installed in its place, which turned out 2,300 horsepower. For high-altitude flight, the cockpit was pressurized, and the pilot would enter the aircraft from underneath the fuselage by sitting in his pilot seat, which was then electrically raised into position inside the craft. Armament would comprise two powerful 37mm cannons and two standard 50 caliber machine guns. Uniquely, the two machine guns were located in movable mounts that could be trained onto a target, giving the XP-54 a true advantage in a dogfight. Sadly, however, performance of the aircraft was lackluster at best, never exceeding 381 miles an hour, when operational fighters were already exceeding 400 and looked only to increase. With delay after delay, the US AAF made it clear that it wasn't interested in the design, and the aircraft was relegated to testing before grounding due to a lack of spare parts. Next to fly was Curtis Wright's XP-55 Ascender, which employed swept wings, and like the XP-54, was originally going to be powered by the X-1800 engine. He was given a propeller jettison lever in the cockpit to prevent him from being killed by the spinning blades as he left the aircraft. Armaments comprised of two 20mm cannons and two 20 caliber guns. The first prototype would have a short life, crashing just four months after its first flight on January 13th, 1943 with test pilot Harvey Gray managing to successfully bail out before the aircraft smashed into the ground. A second, slightly modified prototype flew for the first time on January 9th, 1944, followed by a third prototype, which incorporated even more design changes following the crash of the first. Although performance was slightly better than the XP-54, the XP-55 still came up short compared to conventional fighters, this performance deficit only being exacerbated by the introduction of new jet fighters, and so no orders were placed. On May 27th, 1945, the third prototype crashed during a low-altitude barrel roll at an air show at Wright Field, Ohio, killing pilot William C. Glasgow and four people on the ground. Finally, there was the most radical of the trio, Northrop's almost stealthy-looking XP-56, known as the Black Bullet. Designed to have as minimal a fuselage as possible to reduce drag, the aircraft looked like a full-size horizontal tail and only featured a small vertical stabilizer underneath the fuselage. This time, armament comprised of two 20mm cannons and four 50 caliber machine guns. First flying on September 30th, 1943, the XP-56 would prove superior to both its competitors, making the XP-54 especially look like a slouch thanks to the 56's top speed of 465 miles per hour. However, the XP-56 was plagued with stability issues, forcing Northrop to quickly add a vertical stabilizer. However, less than a month after its initial flight, it would be lost when a tire burst during a high-speed taxi run although fortunately test pilot John Myers escaped with only minor injuries. A second prototype took to the air on March 23, 1944, but stability problems persisted, and after only 10 flights, the program was deemed too hazardous to continue and was cancelled. While no operational aircraft emerged from Proposal R-40C, it showed that the US was willing to push the boundaries of aviation technology in order to achieve superiority in the air. Research conducted during the development of these three aircraft would bear fruit in later types, particularly with the new, more radical jet aircraft of the late 1940s and 50s.
And there you have the tale of the peculiar allied prototype planes of World War II. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.